Uh, my name is uh, Dimitri Psaltis. Together with Mikhailis Tredafilou, we are chairing this panel. Uh, the panel is on decarbonization of uh, the shipping industry. Two topics that individually I think are very important for Greece in particular, and of course the planet. And uh, uh, the, the decarbonization itself is a very important topic, but in Greece, the, which is a big important uh, uh, sector uh, of shipping, it will be very interesting to see what, uh, what might be one of these targeted, uh, targeted uh, uh, activities we can, we can uh, have for Greece and how us may, may contribute. I'll start by introducing some of the uh, panel members. Uh, very happy to have here Dimitris Fafalios, who is a uh, uh, publicity ship owner, uh, well, owner, ship owner in, in Greece. He is president of... Um, Let me get it right so I don't make it... Uh, of, uh, of the Fafalios uh, shipping uh, industry, and he is also uh, uh, chairman of Intercargo, which is an organization that uh, Intercargo stands for International Association of Dry Cargo Ship Owners. He did his education at MIT, where he met Michael Stradafilo, and uh, uh, he's always a very uh, outspoken and uh, uh, very holistic uh, view of the, of the whole topic we have today. Uh, the, uh, uh, the other member of the panel that's uh, with us today is uh, uh, Panos Kutsurakis, who works at ABS, which is a, a company in Singapore, where he is, and he specializes on sustainable solutions to various aspects of, uh, of uh, industry, but particularly he specializes on shipping. So his, uh, uh, his views are very appropriate for, for, for our panel. And, uh, and now I'll pass the baton to my uh, colleague, Mihaly Sredafilou, who will introduce our first speaker. Okay, good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the main speaker of this event, who is, who is uh, Harilos Psaraftis, who has a very distinguished career at MIT and then at uh, NTUA and then at the uh, Technical University of uh, Denmark. And he has been involved uh, closely with IMO and uh, has spent his career studying the uh, effects, its effects of, of shipping. So we are looking forward to his uh, talk, especially because this was IMO week. So many of the things he's going to say are news to certainly to me and to, to many of us. So very like. Thank you and. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank uh, Michalis and the association for inviting me to this, uh, to this panel. And I will try to uh, say something on uh, shipping decarbonization. And first of all, see if I can manage this uh, gadget here. Uh, Yeah, okay, so um, I will um, uh, try to uh, give you an overview of recent developments to decarbonize shipping and try to assess prospects uh, for the future. And the disclaimer I want to make is that uh, what I'm going to say is uh, surely not complete, uh, not encyclopedic. I'll try to, to give you uh, the, uh, what I think is more important. Um, the reference is about uh, close to 50 years of maritime R&D starting from MIT and then going to NTUA and then DTU, Technical University of Denmark, where I am right now. And uh, regarding uh, the specific subject, I've been involved uh, something like 16 years in the IMO process. IMO, I will explain what IMO is in a minute. And about 16 years of R&D in uh, shipping emissions, uh, not only greenhouse gas, but other emissions, and some, also some recent research in, in, this, in this area. Very briefly about myself, and Michael said that uh, I, I finished my PhD uh, in, at MIT, and then I uh, sp spent 10 years on the faculty at MIT, and then I moved to Greece at NTUA. And uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I moved to Denmark, the Technical University of Denmark, and also spent some, some time in, uh, running the port of Piraeus uh, for something like five and a half years. And you can see my, my research interest on the right hand side, uh, maritime logistics, uh, port logistics, uh, intermodal logistics, green logistics, transport policy, etc., etc. 
so uh, I will cover uh, first some basics because I understand that uh, not everybody in the audience is familiar with uh, shipping or, or this subject. Then talk about IMO action and then EU action in this area and then uh, talk about the prospects. First of all, the basics. Uh, but I, I will, I will uh, wait one second. <laughs> Yes, yes. So, uh, the basics first. Uh, so, we're talking about shipping or maritime transport. It carries something like 90% of the world trade, about 70% of the value of the world trade. So, it's something that uh, it's big. I mean, we cannot uh, uh, neglect it. And uh, here is a, is a graph by UNCTAD. UNCTAD is a, a UN agency based in Geneva. United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. They are doing all kinds of studies. So this graph here shows the evolution of maritime trade uh, over the years, and it's broken down by uh, cargo category, uh, dry bulk, uh, container, oil, gas, uh, and, and chemicals. And you see overall, uh, with some exceptions, and uh, a positive trend. World fleet, uh, we're talking about, uh, depends on how you classify. If, you, if, you, if you're talking about the ships above uh, 1,000, uh, about uh, 100 gross tons, uh, it's more than 100,000 ships, commercial ships, uh, and they are broken down in um, various categories like bulk carriers, tankers, container ships, other types. Um, and, and, and the graph on the right shows the, the growth uh, uh, statistics. You, you see generally a positive growth, even though the growth is not constant. Uh, I don't know if this is news to you, but Greece is number one in terms of uh, ownership, ship ownership. So if there is a, 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 a sector in the global economy in which Greece is number one, it is shipping. So here is a, a list of the 20 top uh, fleets uh, ranked by tonnage. So it's Greece, China, Japan, Singapore, etc., etc. So, but, but Greece is number one. Uh, and then uh, we're looking at the EU, uh, so uh, in the EU, uh, maritime transport carries something like 90% of the external trade of the EU and about 30% of the internal trade. Uh, and uh, this is a graph showing the evolution of uh, uh, ton kilometers. Uh, the horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is the billions of ton kilometers of the main modes, and you, you see that road is number one uh, for intra-European freight followed by sea, the so-called source of shipping, and then you have rail, inland navigation, pipeline, etc. And also, you see some growth statistics. Uh, the, the fastest that grew in this period is air, 45.4%. Uh, Actually, 2020 was a, a strange year because of COVID. But uh, road uh, grew faster than uh, sea, and then you have inland navigation and rail grew almost uh, 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 zero. Now, we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions. So what are the greenhouse gases? You have mainly CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, but you also have methane. You have nitrous oxide and some others. How many, how much uh, greenhouse, uh, how many uh, emissions from shipping are attributed to greenhouse gases? It's about a billion tons per year. I mean, more or less to give an order of magnitude. And it's about 3% of the total anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases, by comparison, the road is about 20%. And you see this pie chart here, you have electricity and heat production, about 35%, uh, uh, manufacturing, 18%. Road is 21 about 20%, aviation, about 2%. And looking at the EU, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transport, the, the biggest uh, share of the pie is road transport, 77%. Uh, Navigation, including uh, inland navigation and also social shipping, is about 15%, and uh, uh, aviation is 7.1. 7, 7 okay, so what is the IMO now to answer your question? <laughs> so IMO stands for the International Maritime Organization. It's a specialized UN agency which is based in London, which is tasked to regulate shipping, all aspects of uh, shipping, um, and safety, uh, environment, whatever. And specifically uh, about greenhouse gases, we have this uh, so-called Marine Environment Protection Committee, or MEPC, which is the committee that is tasked, the committee that makes the decisions uh, 
uh, this task to, uh, to uh, study all the uh, matters that pertain to the environmental performance of, of shipping. So this is a picture of the headquarters of the IMO in London. My, my own involvement is, I've been there many times and uh, I, I chair some uh, working and correspondence group on, on environmental risk evaluation criteria. I've been a member of the expert group on so-called market-based measures for greenhouse gases and I have contributed to a number of submissions to the IMO. So uh, what is a submission? It's a, it's a document that is submitted. This is a picture of a document that I contributed uh, recent years to uh, on behalf of Denmark, France, and Germany to um, uh, propose a, a, a short-term measure. I'll talk about short-term short measures in a, in a minute. Now, by, by sheer coincidence, and maybe uh, I don't know if we designed this on purpose, uh, this week is MEPC 80, which is the 80th se session of the MEPC. Uh, started on Monday and will finish today. Uh, and it's, it's a very important MEPC meeting uh, in terms of deciding how to proceed on, on greenhouse gases. Now, before MEPC 80, we had MEPC 73 a few years ago, uh, five years ago. Uh, and um, they decided what is, uh, what they, they adopted what is known as the initial IMO strategy. And they had some very ambitious goals, uh, at least two of them. Is, uh, one is to reduce annual greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2050 uh, versus 2008 levels. And there is an inter intermediate target uh, to reduce annual CO2 emissions per transport work by at least 40% by 2030, uh, pushing towards 70%. So this is a picture of the main hall at the IMO where these decisions are, are made. So this is a very important part of the IMO strategy. Any idea who opposed this strategy? USA. USA. Okay, you are, you are right. It's not only USA, it's these, these three countries, actually. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and the United States. And uh, remember 2018, we were, uh, USA was under the Trump administration. Trump, uh, took the U.S. outside the Paris Agreement. Now the U.S. is, is, is more proactive under the Biden administration. I mean, they are, they, they are one of the most proactive countries. But uh, uh, in uh, 2018, they, 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 they opposed it. Uh, MEPC this, this week is to decide to reset this uh, 2050 target to zero. Okay, so let's say not 50%, but uh, go all the way to zero. And then, you know, what are the next steps to reach the new target? This is a um, paper uh, clip a uh, few days ago, and it shows this, uh, this cartoon over there, which has the IMO on one side and China on the other side. <laughs> so I'll talk about China in a minute. I mean, what's the influence of China in this process? And then last week, there was a preparatory meeting, and this is a picture outside the headquarters or some... some uh, uh, environmental NGOs uh, who, uh, who want 50% uh, by 2030. So, the problem is the following, that uh, the trend is disturbing in the sense that uh, you have these targets, but according to some statistics, uh, in particular this uh, so-called fourth IMO greenhouse gas study in 2020, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions have increased by something like 10% from 2012 to 2018. And the question is what to do to reverse this trend and what to do to uh, reach the 2050 target, the 50 percent target, let alone the zero uh, greenhouse gases uh, target in 2050. And actually there are some more recent statistics that show uh, this trend, continue. these statistics are to, uh, until uh, 2022, the ones on the left show by, by ship category, there's an upward trend in greenhouse gases. The one on the right shows the so-called carbon intensity, which is CO2 divided by transport work. I'll talk about it in a minute. And you see there that there is, uh, for some uh, segments, uh, a downward trend, but uh, for some other set segments, a, a kind of constant uh, carbon intensity. Okay, what do we do about this? So this is the kind of a classical breakdown of measures, uh, broken down in three, these three categories, technological, logistics-based, and market-based. So technological, we built the 
more efficient engine or a, be a better uh, hull from a hydrodynamic viewpoint or carbon capture or alternative fuels or, or, or the things that you see over, the, over there. Then logistics based is uh, speed reduction. I mean, if you go slower, you emit less CO2 or optimize the routine and several others. And then you have market based measures like uh, uh, emissions trading system or uh, action fuel or whatever. Uh, so this distinction, I think, is artificial in the sense that if you have market-based measures, it, it may induce both technological measures and logistics-based measures. And to give you an idea, uh, I mean, here on the left you have a, a kite, uh, a sail, and uh, the idea is that you reduce the, the, the resistance by having something like that. The, the picture on the right is you generate bubbles at the keel of the vessel and the bubbles generated reduce the frictional resistance, therefore the fuel consumption. But also you have the alternative low carbon fuels, electric propulsion, batteries, for example. I mean, the big discussion on that. The first mandate that measure that the IMO took uh, was in 2011. It, 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 it is about the so-called energy efficiency design index. And this is a picture of the Greek delegation at that meeting. And then I can see Panos Zachariadis, who was also there. Uh, At the younger, the younger. Uh, everybody was younger. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, and there was, it was a very difficult discussion because uh, these countries, uh, China, uh, Brazil, India, Saudi Arabia, and some others, they didn't want it. Uh, they, they forced a vote. Actually, the, the IMO hates votes. Uh, they want to do, to do things by consensus, but there was a vote there, and EDI passed. So what is EDI? EDI is this formula here. Uh, but actually, <laughs> it, it looks more difficult than it is. What it is, is, is a ratio. The numerator is uh, the CO2 emissions for a ship. And then the denominator is the transport work, as a measure of the transport work of a ship. And the units are grams of CO2 per ton mile. And you want to have this index as, as low as possible. And there are some reference lines, I mean, the one on the right, so you have to be, this is for bulk carriers, you have to be below the reference line to be EDI compliant. So that was in 2011. Then you had this strategy in 2018 and they have listed the, the, the measures into three categories, short term, medium term, and long term, depending on when these measures are decided. So here, short terms are until 2023, we are now. Uh, sample measures, I'll talk about it in a minute. Then medium term is mostly market-based measures. Long term, you have alternative fuels. So the short term, short -term measures, so, uh, two years ago, they adopted a combined EXI SEMP CII measure where EXI is the application of EDI to existing ships. Remember, EDI is only for ships after 2012. So EXI extends this to the whole fleet. And SEMP is the so-called ship energy efficiency management plan, but perhaps more interesting is the so-called CII, which is critical for the uh, 2030 target, the 40%, which is, uh, again, a ratio of CO2 for a particular ship, uh, CO2 emitted by the ship in a year, divided by the transport work of that ship in a year. And you want to have this ratio as low as possible. Actually, they have a rating system. Uh, ships A and B are the good ships that have low CII and ships D and D are the ships with high CII and C is somewhere in the middle. And they have decided a kind of, as I said, non-linear reduction scale to reach the 2030 target, 1% per year until 2023, which is this year, and then 2% per year between 2023 and 2027, and then it's open what happens between 2027 and 2030, they will decide that on 2026. In fact, there are two ways to measure this index. One is so the so-called uh, supply-based on the left, uh, based on the so-called annual efficiency ratio, where you, you just divide the CO2 by the product of the ship's dead weight times the distance sailed in a year. And then you have the EOI on the right-hand side, energy efficiency operational indicator, where, again, the numerator is CO2, but the denominator is the actual ton miles that are carried by the ship and you need to know the cargo information to compute it. Does it make a difference? It does make a difference. Uh, if, if, if you want to reach the 2020 20 target, 2030 target, 
If you use AER, you need to reduce it by 22%. If you use EUI, you want to reduce it by 11%. So there was a big fight uh, among the MO, you know, which one. Finally, they decided to use uh, AER. Is it a good index? We can ask the opinion of, of uh, the industry here. But my own, my own opinion is it's not a good index. In this paper, we have shown that you can manipulate CII to achieve compliance, but increase CO2 in the process. Uh, and it's not only me who said that this is a statement by the CEO of MSC. MSC is the number one container line in the world saying that uh, it's not a good index and the rules punish, uh, punish at random and will reduce fleet capacity. Anyway, uh, if you look now at the strategy, you will see also market-based measures in a kind of indirect way, they say, possibly including market-based measures. So let's talk a bit about market-based measures or MBMs. How does an MBM work? Well, uh, it, it, it applies the so-called polluter pays principle. When you pollute, you pay. By internalizing the external cost of greenhouse gas emissions. And what it does is it induces operators and investors to adopt measures, I mean, try to change the behavior of the operators and investors uh, to, to uh, adopt measures that will induce greenhouse gas emissions. And these measures can be logistics-based measures in the short run or technological in the long run. I'll give you an example, a logistics-based example. You put a tax on fuel, um, it induces ships to, to, to go slower because uh, the price of the fuel is, is, is higher. CO2 is a nonlinear function of speed, and therefore slow steaming will reduce the CO2 emissions. That, that's a kind of short-term effect of, uh, of a, of a market-based measure. The technological long-term effect is uh, it will um, induce a ship owner to buy an energy-efficient ship or a ship that uses low zero car carbon fuels. It's better to do this than pay the, 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 the MBM. And also, the MBM can bridge the fuel price gap because there's a big f uh, price gap right now and incentivize the use of alternative fuels. What else can uh, the MBM do? It is just co collect money that can be used to reduce greenhouse em emissions out, out of sector, as we say. So there is this distinction between in-sector reductions. In-sector reductions is the, the reductions of, of the emissions of a particular ship or the fleet in sector, the sector is shipping. Out of sector is you take the money and you reduce greenhouse emissions somewhere else, like build a wind farm in New Zealand or a solar farm in Indonesia. This is the so-called offsetting. The masters of offsetting is aviation. And you have the ICAO, which is the equivalent of the IMO in aviation, and they have this scheme called, I'm mean, not an expert in aviation, but I, I, I heard about it. The so-called Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, so-called Corsia or Corsia. Uh, how it works is you, you buy your ticket and you have the chance by paying a few euros or a few dollars to make your trip carbon neutral. Uh, all, all, uh, all airlines offer this, uh, this service. I don't know, have, has anybody used this uh, to make the trip carbon neutral? In the I, haven't, I haven't done it. And of course, this is on a voluntary basis. And the question is, what do they do with this money? How, how, I mean, what are the reductions that they achieve? Well, I mean, if you read the course, yeah, the, 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 the main scheme is to plant <coughs> trees, actually. They have a, all, all, all of the airlines have very ambitious reforestation programs. Um, but, I mean, something like that is not for shipping. I mean, offsetting is, is, is not, for the moment, uh, there are some people who want it, but it's not, it's not in, the, in, the, um, in the program. Uh, the discussion of MBMs at the IMO is not new. There has been history. Uh, there was an expert group uh, in 2010. I was a member of this expert group and produced a big report. There were 11 MBM proposals. Uh, there was no preference for an MBM. Various discussions. And then in, a few years later, that discussion was suspended. So, well, sorry, we cannot continue this discussion. I mean, for political reasons, I mean, we stop. I mean, we, we put it aside. Uh, but it has restarted. Uh, as, as, uh, last year, for example, the, 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 there have been some proposals on market-based measures, and um, 
this week that, have, that were discussed and some delegations support that the levy or a reward or a fee bait means that you get some money and you channel some of the money back to some ships that are you know, green. Then the EU27 plus the European Commission, EC is the European Commission, they propose the fuel standard and the levy, and Norway has proposed the emissions trading system, which is also an MBM. Uh, who are for and against the levy at the IMO? So on the left hand side are delegations that are uh, for a levy, mainly uh, the Pacific Islands. Pacific Islands are very vocal, I mean, they say that in a few years we'll be below water. Uh, we need the levy. Uh, they, they aim to get money out of the levy. Uh, so I put some, uh, some of the islands. The EU27 is for a levy. Japan is for a levy. Or so, uh, International Chamber of Shipping, uh, one of the biggest uh, ship owner associations. Other shipping associations. And then against the levy, you have these countries, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, and other South American countries that they say the levy is going to destroy our economy. I mean, that's their position. Then Norway is not for a levy, they are for ETS, and the United States is kind of neutral, they are not in favor of any <coughs> economic measure, and there is no consensus at this point. Uh, the EU 27 plus European Commission proposal, they call for a fuel standard plus a levy. And here, I want to open a parenthesis, and the, the EU, when uh, Mrs. von der Leyen took office in 2019, one of the things she said is she wants shipping included in the EU ETS. ETS is the emissions trading system of the EU, uh, covers all kinds of industries, electricity, production, or whatever. Shipping is not included. But she said, I want shipping included in the ETS. Uh, and this is, she said that in the context of the so-called uh, European Green Deal, which is a, ba a big package of measures, and one, of the, one pillar of the European Green Deal is the sustainable mobility. When you have, have mobility, but sustainable. So, I think this is the elephant in the IMO room, because we have all this discussion about market-based measures at the IMO. At the same time, the EU is proceeding you know, full speed with the ETS, which is a market-based measure. And in fact, uh, uh, they passed it through the Parliament in 2020. They had a proposal for a directive in 2021, and uh, it's moving, uh, actually. Uh, how is it going to work? It's going to in involve 100% uh, of CO2 emissions from all intra-EU trips, independ ships independent of flag, uh, any ship that calls at EU ports. 100% of CO2 emissions in EU ports, 50% of CO2 emissions from trips between EU and non-EU ports, uh, and then uh, you follow the system that has been established. Uh, you buy allowances. There's a phase-in period, 2024 to 2026, and it will extend to other greenhouse gases uh, as of 2026. What are the challenges for ETS? One is price uncertainty. I mean, the price is determined by the market. It does not provide the kind of stable price signal. That's one, and the other is this, uh, it's a very heavy from an administrative viewpoint. You have to issue the allowances, buy, redeem them, and all that. Now, about a year ago, we wrote a paper with a former PhD student of mine, which we examined the risk of carbon le leakage due to the fact that some container lines may want to switch their transshipment hub. And transshipment is, is very common in container operations. Switch it from a EU port to a non-EU port which is uh, nearby. So we examined two scenarios, switching from Algeciras, Spain to Tangier in Morocco, and switching from Piraeus to Izmir. And, um, Piraeus container terminal has something like, I mean, it's a big uh, operation. 90% of the traffic is transshipment. And so we identified the, the risk of carbon leakage, and that's just by coincidence, a few months later, we heard that Maersk uh, will drop Al Algeciras in favor of Tangier in one of their, of their services. So uh, there is definitely a risk of evasion and carbon leakage. And uh, if, if you compare the initial version of the uh, directive, which did not take into account such a, such a version, if you compare it with the final version, they have explicitly recognized uh, this risk and uh, have introduced language to discourage transshipment at non-EU ports. 
And actually, it's not clear whether that loophole was closed because we saw very recently this uh, press release by ESPO. ESPO is the European Seaport Organization that say, well, uh, we should be on the alert and uh, for early and robust action to prevent uh, evasion. Uh, in parallel, the, uh, the EU uh, has uh, promoted uh, uh, the so-called fuel EU maritime uh, regulation, and what that is is they want to promote uh, the, the use of alternative, uh, sustainable alternative fuels. Uh, and um, now this this uh, regulation has passed. Uh, it's going to be applied as of next year, I think. It is based on so-called well-to-wake approach. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. It's, and it's not limited to CO2, but it includes, includes all greenhouse gases. So here, the, the distinction between tank to wake and well to wake, tank to wake is the operational emissions, I mean, the emissions that are coming out of the, the exhaust of the, of, the, of the ship. But you have also, if you burn hydrogen or ammonia that does not produce greenhouse gases, the question is how do you produce this, uh, uh, these fuels? So you have here the well to tank emissions emissions associated, the so-called upstream emissions. And this is a graph showing a variety of, uh, of uh, marine fuels uh, and, and, and what is their well-to-tank uh, well emissions and tank-to-wake emissions. So there is the discussion of the IMO is now shifting because right now the IMO is tank-to-wake. But now it's gradually shifting this discussion to uh, well-to-wake. There are some uh, industry initiatives. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, the, in Denmark, we have the, the uh, so-called zero carbon center by, uh, under the MERSC uh, umbrella. They have been doing a lot of uh, research uh, to uh, decarbonize shipping. Uh, and they have a lot of activities. This is a picture from APC 80 yesterday. This is the Secretary General of the IMO. He seems happy. Uh, because they have concluded on an agreement. Um, I've, I've tried to follow this discussion. I, I just saw today's headlines. I'm of forces uh, wish and the prayer carbon deal as Greens bemoaned checkpoint uh, targets. It seems that uh, uh, countries like China, Brazil, and Argentina have been successful in, in uh, having a uh, uh, they are not decide on critical issues like a carbon levy or whatever. And uh, the other funny statement that I found uh, interesting is this one. Uh, it's hard to think of an international organization more useless than the IMO with the exception of international football for the, uh, FIFA. <laughs> this is from an environmental NGO. But I mean, on a more serious note, I mean, there are, there are many issues that are open at this point. Uh, what will be exactly in the basket of measures? I mean, there's, they, they want to have a technical part, which is, you know, green fuels or whatever, and the an economic part, which is a levy or ETS. What will be the impact of this basket of measures uh, on the economies of states? Uh, there's a big discussion about the comprehensive in impact assessment. The issue of offsetting. Right now, uh, there is not, not, nothing mentioned of offsetting. So there, were, there was a move by some countries like uh, EU, USA, and some others to exclude it. I mean, say, in the revision of the strategy, we say we do not allow offsetting. And then there was an uh, objection by China, Brazil, etc., who said, no, let's not say that. Uh, so right now, they don't say anything. I mean, it's, it's, it is open. Uh, and uh, as far as the prospects uh, go, in my opinion, I think, well, I mean, they're, they're still wide divergence of views, many support the levy variant, but some others disagree. Uh, the interface between IMO and the EU uh, is, is unclear. I mean, right now there are two parallel processes. Uh, there's no connection uh, between the two, even though the, the, the European Commission is, has observer status at the IMO and the, 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 they participate in the discussions of the IMO. And and uh, as, as a general uh, thing, I think the, the road to full decarbonization is foreseen to be long, in my opinion. Okay, so this is what I mean. We have a, a number of papers. Uh, was, uh, if you are interested, I can send them. And also there was there is this book that uh, I published. I mean, I didn't write it. I, I, I wrote a couple of chapters uh, called Sustainable Shipping, uh, shipping that uh, has uh, uh, several chapters from uh, several several perspectives. 
So this is what I wanted to say, and uh, thank you again.